This is Dan McCarthy, and you're listening to Check In by TMR. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. For this episode, I was lucky enough to speak with Sherwin Banda, the president of African Travel Inc., the luxury tour operator specializing in travel to Africa from the Travel Corporation. Among the people I've spoken to in this series, Sherwin's story stands out. Born and raised in South Africa during the height of apartheid in that country, Sherwin's journey into and through the travel industry was more than just a career path for him. Instead, he speaks about how getting into travel and hospitality was a lifeline to the rest of the world, an opening to so many different people and cultures that he could melt into, an environment that let him grow into the incredibly vibrant and passionate person he is today. I was fortunate enough to meet Sherwin for the first time face to face a couple of months ago, and right away it was clear how passionate he was about sharing the story of Africa with travelers and helping to boost an industry so hurt by the pandemic, an industry that in his words found him instead of the other way around, and one that allowed him to seek out and find the kind of community that surrounds him today. He really has an incredible story, and it was one that made me want to stay quiet during the interview and and let him talk, trying to do my best not to get in the way of anything that he wanted to communicate. There were some incredibly important lessons that Sherwin pointed out during the conversation, lessons that I felt particularly lucky to be able to share with you all, and lessons that I think fit so well in this kind of series. I don't want to go on too too much farther. I want to let Sherwin's story stand for itself, but I want to thank him for being so honest and open with me during the conversation. And I want to thank you all once again for tuning in today. So let's check in with Sherwin. Daniel! Sherwin, hello. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm in New York and we're having, It's. I mean, I was very much looking forward to fall here and it's. it seems like we're back. It's 85 degrees and it's, you know, it's very uncomfortable here. So I was I was looking to be as comfortable as possible too. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you, while I can appreciate summer, I am not a fan of summer. I don't like getting hot and uncomfortable. We were in Maui um, two weeks ago and it was really, really hot. I got so badly sunburned. I'm still having some damage on my face. But yeah, no, I, I, I'm looking forward to the cooler weather. I mean, LA doesn't get as cold as New York, but yeah. it's, at least it's not going to be, you know, a 95 and above. Well, you're from, I mean, you're from South Africa. So I, I, I assume the weather in South Africa is kind of, hu- kind of humid and, and, and pretty warm, isn't it? No? So there are different parts to South Africa. I've always grown up in Cape Town. Uh, it's on the coast. Okay. And the weather is very, very mild. In, in actual fact, the winters are really cold. Oh. Uh, and when I say cold, I mean, it sometimes goes down to 50 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, it's like, it's known, of the, it's known as the Cape of Storms because when those winter weathery storms come in i mean it's pretty pretty cold nothing like east coast winter of course but for most people in south africa that's cold yeah it's that that's a pretty nice day here in new york if we had a 50 55 degree day i would very much look forward to that um but so how long have you been how long have you been in los angeles how long have you lived there i always have to go back so i moved here originally in 2003 and then my son was born uh, in 2012 so and then in 2011 we moved to South Africa for four years so that's 11 12 13 14 so yeah 2015 I came back and I've been here since so six years now I would say 14 years that's that's incredible. Um, yeah. I know. So I've, I've read some interviews you've done with a few other publications, and I know you've sort of been around the world. Like you've you've lived in several different places around the world. I know you spent some time in London too, and I'd love to talk about that too. But how? So how long have you been with African Travel? I know. I know it's sort of the perfect brand for you too. After after speaking with you a few weeks ago, it just seems to fit you so well. How long have you been with uh, with African Travel and with the TTC? So twenty uh, since twenty fifteen. Okay. So it's a very funny story. I was the general manager of a hotel in Cape Town during the four years that when I uh, uh, returned to South Africa. I absolutely loved 
working in hotels. You know, I've gone to Cornell. I always thought I was going to be a hotelier. I loved dressing in up in my, you know, Armani suits or, you know, Gucci suits. And you know, that, that was my life with my pocket squares and everything. So I really enjoyed that. And my, my client was TTC, the Travel Corporation. So African Travel was actually my client. And I had great relationships. And then when I was ready to leave South Africa, Lucille Serve, the CEO for the Africa division, who was my client, had come and stayed with us. And I had told her, listen, I'm returning back to the US, but I'm going to make sure that you are well looked after with a new GM that's coming in and I'll make the introductions. And she was like, oh my God, no, you can't leave us. So, sorry, so what, what what were your plans when you were coming back? So you were leaving the hotel, you were coming back to the US. What were your plans? What were your plans before the, uh, the I guess, the opportunity opened up with African travel? I was going to go back into hotels. Just, uh, I have a, a big network because I've yeah. worked in hotels here and I was just going to take some time off and take a month or two off and then resume, you know, my my search for the proper, for a proper fit. That was my intention. And then maybe a month later, I think, I get this call uh, from African Travel and I immediately include my international sales manager. Because I'm thinking, you know what, I want to make sure that things is going to be well looked after. And I picked up the phone and I said, hi, I'm here with Mana, who was my international sales manager. And uh, we're ready to, to, to hear what you would like to talk to us about. And she goes, uh, actually, this is not a call for Mana. We just really, really want to talk to you. And I said, okay, Mana, you go. And literally, I was told there's an opportunity. Do you want to be the president of African Travel? We believe you'd be a great fit. And that was my story <laughs> in terms of joining African Travel, which I'm absolutely thrilled about. Yeah, it is. It is a great company. I mean, when we when we were together in Las Vegas, we had about a seven minute conversation as part of those roundtables. Right. And uh, you mentioned the LGBTQ tours. You mentioned a lot of other stuff African Travel is doing now. Um, I wanted to ask you because the pandemic seems to have prompted a lot of people to pursue these bucket list trips. And what African Travel offers seems to be the ideal bucket list trip for so many people. And I'm wondering how has the pandemic impacted like interest in African travel and sales and bookings and things like that? We are obviously not left untouched yeah. <laughs> by what has been going on over the last year and a half. And the great excitement for us at African Travel is when we look at 2022, we are up significantly 140% up on 2019 numbers, which is very exciting for us. Because you know, I'm sure you know this, but when you look at international travel out of the US, stats show us that less than 10% of US international travel touches the continent of Africa in terms of all the outbound travel. And that's, that's in a typical year, too. That's not just... That's in a typical year. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we scratch our heads saying, why? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and for me, it's Africa's misunderstood. People don't know what they don't know. Yet, when you survey people upon their return, hands down, people say, it's the trip of a lifetime. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from so many people that it's the trip of a lifetime. Uh, I've spoken to so many advisors who've gotten the opportunity to go fairly recently, and they just said it changed their life. Yeah, I mean, you asked the question, and I mean, do you have any answers? I mean, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there's so many misconceptions? I mean, Africa's a massive continent, too. So, like, I, we're talking about Africa as if it's a monolith, and very clearly it's not. But I'm curious what your take in it is, is in that question. I mean, why do you think... Why do you think Americans are seem less interested or have misconceptions about Africa? And I think you mentioned it. People think of Africa as one country. Yeah. <laughs> and that is obviously, as you know, just absolutely not true. Uh, people tend to think that if you go to Africa, you're going there for wildlife and that's the only reason you go. 
Africa offers so much more than wildlife. It is the epicenter of ancient culture. You know, you've obviously heard people say Africa is the cradle of humanity. Yeah. And when you, when you look at history and you study the facts, you know, it really is the place where mankind, mankind as we know it was born. If I just think of South Africa, for example, it is one of the most diverse countries on the continent and mm -hmm. even in the world. It has 11 official languages, wow. official languages. While people may necessarily look the same, they culturally, they are completely different. And you walk in the street and those cultures rub against one another and it has influenced food and cuisine in ways that has brought Cape Town as a foodie destination to the world. It is a place where you, it is a, it's a third world country with a first world infrastructure. Okay. So there are two cities that are closest to Cape Town in the world, maybe three. Sydney, San Francisco, and Vancouver. It is a beautiful city. It has won every accolade in the world. And I love telling people this. It has been voted the design capital of the world multiple times. It's a fun place. So this, this, this idea that Africa is only open for wildlife adventure seekers is not true. While that is overridingly the top bucket list that people want to see in Africa because they can't see wildlife like that anywhere else in the world, Africa has so much more to offer. I could talk for hours on it, so. <laughs> well, I want to I, I, I want to circle back to, to what you mentioned about South Africa or Cape Town. You mentioned 11 different languages. I'm curious what what was your experience growing up? Uh, did you learn multiple languages when you were, you, you, so you grew up in Cape Town. Was that your experience learning multiple languages? And I'm curious, I mean, what was your general sort of uh, childhood and, and, and teenage life like in, in, in Cape Town? We're going to have to reverse back and go back into time into 1973, because that's the year I was born. Okay. The year I was born, South Africa looked very different. It was an apartheid state legal separation based on ethnicity was the law of the land. So my family was a little bit of a conundrum because my grandfather on my dad's side was an immigrant to South Africa from Malawi. So hence my last name, Banda. It is a, of Malawian origin. So I have the pigmentation of a black man, but my, my grandfather who was Malawian married a colored woman. Now a colored woman based in that time in history was a person from mixed lineage or their ancestry tend to be what we know now today as Khoisan, indigenous people of Southern Africa. So when they got married, the law of the land in South Africa at the time said that if you are an immigrant to South Africa, you don't tick the boxes as white, black, colored necessarily. So because my grandfather married a colored woman, he was deemed colored and their families were raised colored, which means they didn't have it as good as the whites, but they certainly didn't have it as bad as the black population of South Africa. Okay. So I, my, my mother was an Afrikaans native, uh, meaning that her first language was Afrikaans and we were taught 
Afrikaans and English in our home. Uh, when my mother wanted to tell us off and scold us, <laughs> <laughs> she would go to us in that Afrikaans language. And Afrikaans language is a very guttural language. I don't believe that I can express myself if I wanted to get to the truest form of who I am. The only words I can think of is from uh, in Afrikaans. It just, it just, it's such a descriptive language and it's the language that just, you know, it takes you directly to your soul. Yeah. Well, that's, that's completely, I mean, that's a completely unique story. I mean, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to talk to a lot of people in the industry, um, but I, I don't think anyone has a, a unique story as you have. Um, it definitely makes you distinct from the rest of the population. I think the population making up travel. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, you spoke about growing up. How did that impact your choice or your desire to get into hospitality to tell you describe sort of working in hotels, things like that? I mean, what led what led to that decision? You know, there were a whole bunch of stuff. I would have to take you to my 22 year old self. Okay. There was an awakening happening in South Africa in, in 94. So I had finished university and South Africa has now come to a place where the status quo could no longer be defended. It was moving into a democracy. And then, so there was this big awakening happening in the country. There's a lot of tension, I assume. There's a lot of, I mean, I, here in the U.S., we speak about political differences all the time, but I imagine it was on a different level in, in, in that time in South Africa. It was in, at a different level because so many people were disenfranchised. And there was this idea that with the changing of the guard will come all this access an opportunity to people who never had the chance to just good education, as an example. And that, that awakening really coincided with my self-identity and, and realization that I too had coming to groups with an awakening. And my awakening was that I was a gay man, right? Um, it was a sexual orientation awakening. And there was this tug of war, you know, it's because it's for anyone who has lived the story will tell you there's a lot of anguish and a lot of stress that happens with the changing of any kind of change. And I, for me, it was interesting to join hospitality because it was the one industry where people of difference was actually embraced. Uh, and that, that sense of you know, flamboyancy was actually a good thing because it meant that not only were you more open to engaging and sharing of yourself, but it also was, in my view, at least at the time, it was also this idea that it was tied to a genuine sense of hospitality. So hospitality chose me as opposed to me choosing hospitality. It, it, it happened in a very roundabout way, very much to the me joining the travel corporation and becoming the president of African travel. At the time I was working retail and I was responsible for public relations for the store. It was a retail store in South Africa. And over the, over the intercom or the, uh, there were announcements made and it was my voice. And there were in-store activities that would happen and people would come in and we would engage them and give our prizes and all of those kind of stuff. In walks a general manager of a hotel across the street from the retail store, he tells me, do you like what you do? You should be in hotels. Here's my card, give me a call. And that's how I started. I started as a night manager uh, in hotels and it gave me access to people that were not born within the borders of South Africa that were white, but were interested in me and my story. And I was just glad to share it. 
so that's how my, I came about to hospitality. That's incredible. That's such an incredible story. And it's so unique because, I mean, I've heard people have ch those kind of chance encounters and, and be able to get employed at these at these incredible travel companies. But yeah, I mean, we're for going from retail to uh, to a GM, the night, a night manager at hotels is, uh, I mean, it seems like a lucky break, but speaking to you, it seems like it would have happened some other way if that, if that, if that chance encounter never happened either. 100%. And it's a lesson that I've learned very early on that it, it, uh, my success and all of our success is intrinsically tied to the people we meet. And if we are able to connect heart to heart with people in a, in a true, genuine fashion, things happen in ways that you could not even think about or dream about or control. I, so I, I wanna I wanna ask a little bit more about you, Sherwin. But I do have some questions about about Africa and about sort of life outside of uh, the industry. But I wanna ask. I mean, I read also in an interview that you you spent some time in London, and I wanna ask because I think you're the 14th or 15th person I've been lucky enough to speak to on this program, and I think four or five of them have mentioned time in London. And it seems to be a strange connection in the travel industry. Time in London for a lot of people, a lot of successful people. I'm curious how you ended up in London and then what uh, what kind of impact did that city have on you as a person? I got a call from a recruiter while I was in South Africa and said, we would love for you to apply for a role in London. That's how I ended up there. But before that happened, I knew that I needed to leave South Africa. I had reached what I wanted to reach in South Africa, and I wanted to experience the freedoms of a first world country. So I, I, I moved to London uh, at the same time. So it's just interesting how things all develop, right? So it's September 2020, uh, 2001, the, literally the month of 9-11. A month before, I actually had a chance encounter, and that was the month I actually met my husband, and he's from LA. Oh, you met him, and, you met him in, in Cape Town in South Africa? I met him in Cape Town while I was living in Cape Town, South Africa, 20 years ago. Wow. What was he doing in, what was he doing in South Africa? He was on vacation in South Africa visiting a friend that was teaching abroad. Okay. And so he came to visit her, and then they came to... Cape Town, and that's where we met. So I meet my husband in August of 2001. We immediately knew that this was something deeper than just, you know, a flirtatious moment. The only way we would be together is if we could narrow the gap between Africa and the US. Yeah, yeah. That was the only way. It was not going to work anyway. <laughs> Two weeks later, I then applied and sent my resume to this recruiting company and I literally got the call. Wow. And uh, a month later, I'm in Europe. So that's a lot closer to the US. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, the, the Europe to the US is not too bad. Uh, what is, so what did you, I mean, it must have been, what were your feelings, I guess, arriving in London and spending those first few months there? Like what, what was the feeling about being in a sort of a completely different world at that point in your life and uh, being with, with someone you love and, and being and sort of embracing this brand new life that you've, you've, you've pursued for yourself. What was the feeling like? Was, I mean, were you nervous? Were you excited? Was it a sort of a mixture? So imagine the fact that the first time I would touch European soul, soil would be 2001. And as a African man, whose whole worldview was based on my experiences in Africa. Imagine landing at Heathrow Airport, <laughs> just navigating the airport alone, and then finding your way to the property that you're supposed to manage. I remember leaving the airport and I had already bought a, a, a bus transit ticket to get me from the airport to the hotel. And I remember standing there with my heart in my chest, thinking, oh my God, what have I just done? 
I, I went to the hotel and I, re, and so I get there in August and I remember my first Christmas in London. One of my, one of my, the anxiety around it was, oh my God, I'm going to be alone. I don't have family here. But then what, I, what, what happened was all of the people in hotels were from all different parts of the world and they never had family. So I had a family of choice. Wow. And each one of these people came from different parts of the world. And London, the melting pot of these cultures was just something that gave me life. And I absolutely loved it. And then experiencing the activities in London, that made me feel so much more at home. The good news was that I spoke English and I spoke English well, and that at least the language barrier, um, we, we, overcome, uh, we overcame quite quickly. Um, and that was part. Uh, so yeah, that was my time in London and, and how I ended up there. Yeah, I, I spent a little bit of time in London, probably not as long as you, but yeah, it was, I, re I remember having that feeling too, uh, of landing in the airport, and I remember trying to get on the tube, because it was cheaper to get to the, 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 the flat I was renting, and I remember just being so completely overwhelmed, but then, I, like, looking back at, I probably spent about 15 months there, and looking back on it, like, I, I, I wouldn't really trade it, it was, it was such a unique experience, and I mean, Probably less so for me than for you because I'm from New York, which is a fairly you know metropolitan place. But uh, it is it is a nice it is it is a unique city, and it is it, the experience I had there. I probably should share some of the same fondness for them as you share for your experiences. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about African travel in general. Uh, we spoke about the misconceptions, but I know there's like passion projects for you within Africa. And I, I read some stuff you've written about rhinos in Africa and species in Africa. And I know we spoke about how wildlife isn't is sort of the poster, the poster of African travel is wildlife. And maybe that's not the full picture. But I mean, what what are what are those discussions like within with you within your your team? I mean, how big of a how big of a thing is keeping the place you visit, keeping it safe and keeping it and I'm doing your best to leave it the better than how you found it and, uh, and uh, sure. dedication to the environment. How important is that to you and your team? It is of utmost importance. Yeah. When we look at um, travel to Africa and why people go there, wildlife is a huge component. And we wouldn't have a robust industry if, it, if the wildlife wasn't protected. Yeah. And if they didn't have areas um, that are protected for their habitat. Imagine the year that I was born, we had 90% more rhino roaming the continent of Africa than we do in today. I mean, just imagine that. Thanks to good conservation practices, rhino rehabilitation and the numbers have increased, but it certainly is a far cry from where we need to be. So what, is, what does that come down to, though, that, that decline in population? Is that poaching? Is that climate change? Is it a mixture of everything? It is largely poaching. Okay. Uh, when you think of big game and how we got to the, the term big five, the term actually originates from a hunting term. Those were the, the animals that hunters wanted to hunt. They were the most dangerous game. They were the biggest game and they were the biggest trophies that any hunter could get. So it's a legacy from a bad time of, of just looking after Africa's wildlife. Uh, and there's this fallacy among certain cultures that the rhino horn, if you, if you shave that down, it has medicinal values. And one of those medicinal values could cure cancer. We know that research shows us that rhino horn is literally like a nail. There's nothing medicinal about it. That was the biggest concern facing Africa. And as a, as a continent and as a destination, we had to have some home truths told to us so that we could really do something to protect the wildlife. 
it is essential at, at the, we exist because we want to make people's dreams come true. That's the reason why we exist. We will not be able to make those clients' dreams come true if these experiences on the continent cannot be realized as part of uh, a, a, an itinerary that they choose to book with us. So conservation is at the core of what we do. We have three pillars that we tick. We stand for people, making sure that the local communities are supported through, through tourism projects. We stand for wildlife, which means we want to protect wildlife and work with ethical partners to ensure that tourism money is given back to wildlife conservation. And the third pillar that we stand for is the planet. Everything and the way that we tread up, up, as we journey uh, across the continent, we have to do so responsibly. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the travel industry, including particularly some segments of the industry, I think get a bad reputation for their impact on the environment. And I was lucky enough to be a part of a tourism cares conference in New York a couple of years ago. And I know the Tolmans were there and then they spoke about their pillars, uh, the TTC. Um, and there's some incredible companies who are who are not only not making an impact on the environment negatively, but were positively impacting the environment. Um, during their travels. I know there's one tour company called Intrepid who is carbon negative now or take his taking out more carbon than they're putting in, which is incredible things to do. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it just seems like something that I mean, you're comp you're obviously highlighting it now, but I think it's just something the travel industry needs to focus on highlighting and speaking about a little more is that, you know, the travel's good for the environment's good for cultures and it's uh, it has a positive impact in a lot of different segments of life. Travel for a force for good can be a hugely impactful to any destination that we choose to travel to. When we, when we look at what travel does for the local people, I would not have had the experiences I've had had it not been for people to come to South Africa and say, oh my God, you kind of interesting, tell us more, right? Yeah. It would have never happened. And travel when done correctly can make a profound difference to the people, but also to the people traveling there when they know that they are leaving behind the place better than they have actually found it. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about another passion project. It's something you mentioned when I saw you in Las Vegas was the the new LGBTQ tours that African Travel is doing. And you spoke about your your growing up in South Africa. And I'm curious, I mean, what kind of impact or what kind of feeling did you have to put these kind of tours together and to be able to offer this kind of unique product to, to clients and to customers and the people who want to you know, travel to Africa who are part of that community? You know, one of the misconceptions that we've just spoken about is that, that Africa is not open or friendly to the LGBTQ community. And that is not entirely true. There absolutely are areas in Africa that perhaps would not be the most friendliest to the LGBTQ plus community. But South Africa had same-sex marriage legalized long before the West even went down that road. We had the most democratic constitution when our nation's democracy was born in 2004. To be able to tell the South African story meant that we needed to include all of the parts of South Africa. And one of the most beautiful parts of South Africa is that it has a very robust LGBTQ plus community. And the mother city Cape Town has been a home to the gay festivals for decades now. It's wonderful to be able to say South Africa as a destination or Africa as a continent offers experiences inclusive for this particular population. And one of the things I was most excited about was when, when Pride Month came, um, I was challenged by, we have a, we have a TTC identity circles within our business that we test 
systems, processes, policies to ensure that it is representative and inclusive for all. And we have a, an LGBTQ identity circle. I was challenged by the participants and they asked me, what does pride mean to you? And one of the things that I said was, well, pride to me means that I can be my whole self when I am at work and unashamedly so. And then I was asked a second question, how do you do that for your guests? And I looked at them and I said, we include and we have guests travel with us regardless of lifestyle, income or color. And then the third question that someone asked me was, Sherwin, what can you do? What can African travel do to send a stronger message to this community? And Pride Safaris was born in that moment. And this is an example when, when we talk to people in our business, they can shine spotlights on opportunities in our business that has not been singled out yet. And that's how it, and how, that's how it came about. And of course, as a South African man, as a gay man, as a person of color, as a Jewish man, those things are important. And I'm proud to say that African travel and the travel corporation as a whole, this is what we want to do for every segment of our, of our population. Hey, you're the, so you're the second member of the TTC that I've had. I've I had, I guess you would call her your colleague even though I know she's in a different brand, but Ellen Betridge, I was able to speak yes. to her. Yeah, and she spoke about sort of the community the TTC provides and then that kind of collaboration and and uh, and discussion among members. It seems like that's that's a philosophy that a lot of you share. 100%. And it's, it's one of our proudest moments. I cannot tell you that the conversations that, that happens, not only during this identity circle conversations, right? But the conversations that we are having today in our business are meaningful conversations, are thought-provoking conversations that challenge us both individually and as a company to do better on so many levels. I'm really, it makes me really proud that it's not just lip service, it is something that we really, really do. And some of the best ideas comes from the people that you least think are going to have the brightest nuggets. So I only have two more quick questions and hopefully I won't take up too much more of your time, but I wanted to ask you just because you spoke about your journey and you spoke about your time in London and Los Angeles meeting your husband. I mean, those 20 years you spent in South Africa, I'm curious, I know you probably spend some time still in South Africa regularly, but <laughs> Is there anything you really miss about South Africa? Anything you daydream about that you wished you could pull over to Los Angeles and be a part of your life daily or weekly or regularly? You know, living in LA, we deal with traffic on a daily basis, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so connectivity is a barrier that we still have to learn how to overcome. And with the best intention, when we get together with people, we say to people, you know what, let's get together. And they go, yes, let's make it happen. And before you know, a month has gone by, two months have gone by, and you didn't connect. There is this hospitality that happens in Africa that you don't have to look for community. Community just happens because it's centered around food and dance and family and friendship. And I wish that we could have a, a, a deeper connection without listing traffic as the barrier. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what do you think that is, though? Do you think that's an American thing? Do you think that's a big city thing? Because, I mean, that happens I, I that happens here in New York, too. And you can it's very easy to get around in New York if you're not in a car, if you're willing to take public 100%. transportation. Yeah. I think it's two things. I didn't have that in London. In London, 
I think largely because the weather is miserable and that's what everybody talks about, people actually find social hubs in pubs. Your yeah. local pub is your local community, <laughs> really. Yeah. And so you never had that sense or that loss of community. I, I do believe that uh, in, in terms of American culture, we work long hours and we work hard. And so the times that we don't work, we stay in our bubbles or our cocoons. Um, and there's a sense of loss that comes with that because you, you're unable to connect or less willing to connect, because you don't have the time to connect. Um, and if there's a lesson that I can take from living in South Africa is that as important as work is, this work-life balance is equally important. Uh, and especially having lived through the last year and a half, I think now more than ever, that human connection, we need to make time for because it serves as good as well as make us good. Yeah, that's, I think that's a lesson. I, I thought I learned that lesson, but I mean, I, I'm probably falling into the same traps I fell into pre-pandemic uh, when it comes to work and things like that. But I, I am completely on board with you. And I think that's such a, that's a, that's really such an introspective thing to think about and to say. Um, I would have never thought about that when it comes to American culture. That's one of the big downfalls, but I'm sure it is. I'm sure outsiders uh, can see it fairly easily compared to people who've been in the culture their whole lives. Um, so it's it's great to hear that. Um, and I just have one more question and then I promise I'll let you go. But I'm curious, you spoke about your career and you're in LA now and it's an incredible company, African Travel. I mean, what do you have any long-term goals, any short-term go goals that you uh, you have on your calendar or any things you want to accomplish bef before your career is over in the, in the travel and tourism industry? Anything, any big goals or anything you want to do with African Travel? So first of all, with African travel, yes. I think that there is a wonderful opportunity to tell the African-American story through journeys in Africa and bringing that to life for this part of the population would definitely be one of our strategic goals for the near future. As we've identified segments this year, we obviously rolled out LGBTQ. A big opportunity for us is to be able to at least tell the African-American uh, story as it originates in Africa. So that's something that we're really exciting, excited to do. I think that, you know, if I, from a career goal perspective, because you asked that question, if I died tomorrow, and this was the last position I have held, I would have died fulfilled because I truly love and enjoy what I do. It ties me to my story. It ties me to Africa. And it allows me to tell the African travel story in a beautiful and an, an authentic way. And I can't imagine doing anything else. For me, true happiness comes from seeing other people happy. And to speak to people as they are in this dreaming phase about what, where they want to go and bringing that to life and serving it up in a way that meets their exact need is something for me that gives me the greatest satisfaction. I guess it would be equated to a heart surgeon, you know, when you're able to take someone who is sick and bring them back to health. I believe travel does that for the soul. It makes us better. It keeps us healthier in terms of our perspective to the world. And it keeps us perhaps working through ideas that we or perceptions that we may have held true and then travel somewhere new unique and new and different and then shed those perceptions and come back with a different view of the world i am i'm living my dream and i am at this point in my life fulfilled with what i do well sharon i i have to say you have to be one of the most unique people I've spoken to and, and such a distinct and, and incredibly vibrant personality. And I want to thank you for the time you give me today and your willingness to share your story. I very much hope to see you in person sometime soon. And yeah, it was, it was really, really great to talk to you.
I look forward to seeing you. I will be in New York in December. And for sure, I need to buy you a drink at least. Yeah, I would I would love that. I mean, <laughs> we we it, the short the short visit we had was not enough for me. And that's why that's why I asked you to be on this podcast. But uh again, thank you, thank you so much and uh good luck with everything. And I'm sure I'll see you very soon. Thank you so much. I hope it was meaningful to you too. It was incredibly meaningful. <laughs> okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Take care, bye.